Miroslav, I know you're a hopeful person. You've told us not to worry. So we... Uh, Jesus did. Jesus did. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so we are going to leave here this morning determined to fix our eyes on the things that are important and not on the things of this world that we tend to worry about. But we all are concerned about our nation and we are concerned about the division, not just before the election, but some of us are even more concerned about it afterwards. And I just want to ask you, we are to look at everything as God's gift to us in creation. We are to look at every one as God's gift to us in creation. When we have no affinity with a person, when we are upset at what people are saying or doing, when we can't understand what someone else thinks or does, not just politically, it can happen in a family, anywhere. How can we change our point of view? How can we change our hearts? What can we do to build a bridge and to come together? Uh, any wisdom here? So anybody wants to <laughs> help me out when Linda asks questions? Um, uh, you're not quite sure who's the proper person to answer them, if anybody is. <laughs> um, so what does one do to uh, kind of create a space in oneself for something or somebody who you feel does not belong there. <laughs> um, how does one, or does one, kind of expand the boundary of one's imagination, one's kind of sense of self so that at least for a moment somebody who strikes us really different can reside there so that we may have a sense of how we might, in a constructive way, engage that person and possibly even learn something from that person. You know, when I was writing a, a book, Exclusion and I Embrace, uh, obviously that was a, uh, I was, trying to puzzle out how do I, as a Croatian, relate to who then were in that war the oppressors of my people, uh, uh, at least uh, some of, among the, the Serbians and many that have identified um, uh, with them. And in the process I was reading, uh, I did a lot of reading, and one book that, uh, one article actually that helped me uh, a great deal was by a psychologist from Israel. And he was talking, arguing in that article for the importance of non understanding. I mean, he meant importance of you not to assume that you understand the other person. <laughs> uh, and therefore that you can already always put that person in the particular box that you have in your own construction of the self for these types of folks. Um, but rather to presume that you might not know something, or at least suspend your judgment enough so that that other person <clears throat> can at least have a chance to appear to you as themselves. And I think the stronger the conflict is, the more determinate our understanding on, of ourselves and of our relation to the other, and other in relation to us is, the more closed we become even those of us who consider, us, consider ourselves pretty liberal, uh, even those of us who consider ourselves pretty generous, we suddenly know what uh, fundamentalist things and why and how one ought to properly respond and why one shouldn't give in or whatever that might be. 
that we are that we are doing. Obviously, if we are now in the in the midst of a struggle, <laughs> um, but if past the finish line the attitudes continue, there will be obviously a breeding ground for more and deeper tensions as we go along. So I think this kind of sense of one's own inadequacy and humility, sense that the other person might have motivations that I can't quite uh, discern and that I might learn something and then um, some kind of willingness to strike a bridge. And by the way, a sense of non-understanding of the other is already a bridge because it contains a question mark. What, what, who, who really are you? I, I can't quite figure it out. That's a bridge. And we should honor it as a bridge uh, rather than treat it simply as a, who are you? <laughs> uh, well, what about trying to change someone's mind? Yes, should of we course. Are doing that or not? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we always try to change other people's <laughs> minds. Uh, I think that's fine. Uh, I, I think we all, uh, in our families, in, in circle of friends that we have, uh, in, uh, in public life, we're all better if we try um, in a particular way, uh, advocate for our position, which then would mean also changing somebody, somebody's mind. I mean, obviously one ought to be smart about it, how one does it. Uh, one ought to be civil about it, how one does it. But I would hope that this would be the feature of our, uh, of our engagement with others. Uh, I mentioned yesterday a bit about this um, almost the importance of truthfulness or, or seeking truth. I sometimes like to think that, that conversations uh, at uh, academic institutions or conversation in public uh, domain, but sometimes also conversations in family, ought to be truth-seeking conversations. Not necessarily uh, fist-pounding on the table kinds of truth-claiming conversations, <laughs> Um, but truth-seeking conversations, uh, which means that there is a circle of exchanges that goes on, and sometimes that seems too, too ideal when, the, when the, the tensions are, are high, but I can engage in a truth-seeking conversation with somebody who I profoundly dis disagree. I can imagine myself in, in their position. I can see what claim their position might have for our lives. And I believe that this kind of, I, I, I call it sometimes double vision. This type of double vision is essential for us to both learn better ourselves and live, live in peace. I can keep asking questions, but if some of you want to uh, ask brief questions, f please feel free, Paul. Yes, now? Yes, now? No? You come up here, Paul, if you don't mind, and we'll work on. Joe, are you up there? I can speak louder. How's it going? I just finished a book uh, by Jean Duffy Elstein called Democracy on Trial. She wrote it in the late 90s. Uh, she's a political theorist. And she was making the argument that identity politics, where people claim that other people can't represent them, that they need to power themselves because uh, other people can't empathize, understand their situation. So they must be part of the political uh, framework in order to do that. My question relates in a related way to what are the limits of empathy? When Jesus, when Paul talks about there being no longer Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free, he's talking about a, a situation in which those characteristics still continue. But people, because they are in Christ, can empathize. 
And Miroslav, uh, not everybody here may know your background in Croatia, so if you could incorporate a little of your history there into your answer, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, very, it's, a, it's a great question about the limits of empathy, and, and prior to that, uh, the, the importance of empathy for, uh, uh, for the pursuit of the common good. Because if you don't have empathy for a variety of constituencies called less vero groups, uh, you'll charge ahead uh, with your own idea uh, without reference to how what you do might, what bearing it might have uh, upon them. So I think it's one of the, the, the crucial virtues. And um, <laughs> it's uh, the, the kind of identity uh, politics, or, or let, let's put it this way, simply social identity groups, whether that's identity politics or not, that may be frayed term, right? Uh, I think in some ways they are both can articulate positions that may garner, if not empathy, at least attention of other people. But on the other hand, they may, identity formation may blind you to other people's groups. You know, uh, Linda mentioned, I should say a little bit about background that I come in former, former Yugoslavia. Most of my work uh, uh, in, this, in this entire field has been triggered by the war in former Yugoslavia. And one of the central things that happened before the war uh, broke out is a strong boundaries uh, and oppositionally defined boundaries between uh, groups, between discrete identities were, were formed. They were formed in adversarial kinds of ways and then uh, by lack of uh, empathy and unwillingness to see have been stabilized and, uh, and strengthened. Right? Uh, so, uh, th there is a definite danger that groups will be less empathetic <laughs> than, individuals, th than individuals can. And so, I think within each of the, of, of the uh, on the other hand, I feel that we need sometimes uh, groups. I, I think uh, the, the idea that there, there are no group, re group representation, I, I think it's il illusory because we can't uh, de facto, even though we possibly could empathize each individual, we don't. We don't empathize unless kind of pressure is being brought to bear upon our, uh, our imagination. And in that sense, I, I would say we each ought to nurture uh, empathy. Uh, and by the way, nurturing empathy doesn't mean agreement. It simply means placing yourself in the shoes of the other and uh, understanding you might still continue to believe what you, what you believe about the matter. But nonetheless, empathy as a kind of uh, as, as a pro uh, for process is, is absolutely, uh, absolutely crucial. And sometimes people don't want to feel empathy because they, they identify empathy with agreement. And I think the principally that ought to be distinguished, empathy and, and, uh, and agreement. Um, uh, we ought to nurture it in each, uh, in, in, within, each of the, uh, of the, within each of us, within each of the, uh, of the groups and uh, highlighted as an important feature of uh, the search for the common, common good. Go ahead, Karen, do you have a question? Uh, that may be working now. There's a little green light on. Picking up on the themes of the sermon and Linda's initial question, I wonder how this concept of flourishing that God created us to flourish and ultimately leads us to uh, a complete flourishing with God present in heaven in this new, new kingdom. How can we use that concept of flourishing to interact with those with whom we disagree or as Linda started out our question. So we've got this political season and it, to my mind one of the things that we're witnessing is we're witnessing people express their heartfelt feelings that they are not flourishing. So how might we use this concept of flourishing and our Christian understanding of flourishing to engage in dialogue with those who may feel they're not flourishing in our society? Mm. Yeah, I, so, so um, 
to answer this question kind of in, in really practical, concrete step kinds of uh, terms, that will be taxing uh, the, this academic. It is kind of beyond my, <laughs> my pay grade, and I, I know that that's really where the, the rubber hits, uh, hits the road. Um, but it, it would seem to me that a flourishing is one of these things that we all share. We may not share the content of the vision of flourishing, but we share desire for flourishing. And I suspect that chances open up after election, which are closed right now. Right now, discussion around flourishing would, would, be, uh, would pretty soon devolve into some kind of a shouting uh, match. Um, but it would seem to me that after, we do, we do have a chance, because I, I do believe that, uh, that even two political traditions in this country, that uh, at least one of them is represented in the extreme, uh, almost in unrecognizable forms, uh, but these two traditions represent varieties of accounts of what it takes to flourish. And kind of substantive discussion in terms of what these traditions, what kinds of concerns, what kinds of visions they have in common, and how we can build on the broad consensus around these issues that we have in common, even if we might disagree sometimes about the ways of achieving those goals. For, for instance, take, take the question of poverty. Uh, that there is at least some kind of lip service pay that we should be concerned for the poor, though in the rhetoric uh, of elections, the, the poor don't play a particularly significant role. We uh, can guess why that might be uh, the case. But if poverty isn't a topic at all, it would be, uh, in a society, it would be a fundamental uh, problem. Right? And it seems to me that for both traditions, it, it, it is a topic, or at least it ought to, it, it'll be easy to see how it could become a topic. And then if discussion becomes, well, so, so what does it mean? How does one get there? That's an already fruitful discussion, rather than uh, one is for poor, the other one isn't for the poor, and the discussion is, uh, is over. And so my sense would be, flourishing might help us tease out ways in which conversations can be had uh, and adjustments in policies also can be had. But that's, a, that's kind of optimistic. <laughs> Other questions? I see. Tom, are you working on something else? Or are you working on your question? <laughs> <laughs> Let me try something um, that I think is very similar, kind of moving in and around what we've been talking about. I read an article very quickly in the paper this morning. I didn't get all of it, but it was about a white national, the son of a white nationalist uh, in this country who was one of the budding stars coming up. And um, in his college, he was invited to a Jewish Seder. Or it was Shabbat, actually it was Shabbat. But he was regularly invited to this, and he began to change his mind simply by being in the presence of someone who is different. Now, you know, I think we experienced this, this in the Presbyterian Church when we went through uh, a tremendous amount of upheaval. We're still going through it because conservative churches are leaving because of gay marriage, uh, the, of the vote to, to open, open us to churches who want to do gay marriage to do them, and then open churches who want to ordain inclusively to do it. And so we, there's, nothing, there's no mandate in any of the decisions that we made. But, you know, in this whole process, it has seemed that the most difficult thing that we have been able to do is actually place ourselves in the presence of someone with whom we disagree and actually have, I mean, even, even if we don't actually have a conversation about the issue. Right, right. Just to be in the presence and see the humanity, see all of those kinds of things. I don't know if there's a question there or not, but I mean, it's a... It's a very important comment, and I, I, I do, and I do, it's important that you ended kind of seeing the humanity, and I think this kind of sense that we, um, 
explicitly or implicitly dehumanize, make that the one with whom we disagree as kind of alien to maybe not human race, uh, sometimes in the, <laughs> in the moment of rage even, even that, and we use kind of the vocabulary that, uh, that re reflects this, this feminism that re reflects this. Uh, but, but kind of we, we, we challenge their, their, hum, their basic human decency and, and humanity. And sometimes getting ourselves out of that generalizing stance uh, can happen via presence, as you describe, of the other person there. Suddenly you re realize th 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 there's kind of, we, we disagree profoundly, but there, there's basic humanity and decency about this, uh, about this person. There's somebody I could work with. I remember during the Cold War, uh, my own teacher, Jürgen Moltmann, um, used to say, you know, we, because the, the, the lines of demarcation I mean, it was, were, were really sturdy, right? Um, no good thing could be said about uh, communists uh, sitting, uh, sitting in Russia. Uh, just like uh, no good thing can be said about uh, certain forms of uh, Muslims um, today. And he said, well, we just have to discover that Russians, that Soviets, uh, cook soup with water as well as we do, <laughs> right? So, so just a simple kind of sense of we have a, a kind of basic humanity and also some basic human decency. And that could happen without discussions about issues that separate us, right? But just presence will often, often do it or a bit celebration of any kind. I think very good. Uh, let me turn the table a minute, and then we want to hear from you, Beth. We've been talking about how we deal with people whom we are tempted to demonize. What about when you're on the receiving end, thinking of Muslims and the, re the way they are received, or um, political people are demonized if you were that person, or if just because of your views you're demonized? How do we get past that to... to show that we are human, or how does a person show his or her humanity or trustworthiness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was thinking about, about my experience growing up, uh, a son of a, uh, of a Pente my, my father was a Pentecostal minister in a very hostile uh, environment, uh, kind of minority of the minority of, of the minority, and in school I was Kind of, the, the, kind of the, the weirdest type of a Christian. That was us. <laughs> uh, and in the situation, being Christian was really bad. But being weirdo like this is kind of uh, crazy. So uh, I sometimes tell the story about uh, at the beginning of school year, about 10, 11, uh, the, and uh, there's this, this book of records, uh, and uh, nothing was electronic, everything was hand, handwritten, so all the names of students and so forth, and then general information. And so you have at the beginning of every school year, you had to kind of give information to your the teacher in front of the whole class. That was a whole uh, two hours were devoted to 30 students telling all the, the stuff. So where, uh, what, what's the name of your father, where you were born, and blah, 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 everything, all the address and everything. So what's the name of your father? Uh, my name, father, uh, my, the name of my father is Dragutin. Um, uh, w w what's your father's profession? My father is a pastor. Now, what's a pastor? We know what a priest is because they're familiar with. So, so now I have to kind of explain. You know, this is kind of like a priest, uh, but but not in a Protestant. What Protestant? What are Protestants? You know. Okay. So I'm ten. Remember, I'm standing in front of the whole class, and I'm trying to explain this stuff. And then said, "Well, okay. So where does your father work? My father works in Christ's Pentecostal Church of Yugoslavia." Christ, that's bad. Uh, Pente so they, they don't know how to pronounce Pente what, what Pentecostal is. Christ pent effing what church? <laughs> and now I have to spell Pentecostal. And I am just, you know, I'm just dying the earth to open up and swallow me in kind of cruel mercy. This, this, this would be, be great. And so uh, basically, the, the, uh, 
my, my parents just grow thick skin. <laughs> That's the only thing you can, uh, you, you can, you can do. But, but I think probably more, more significant than, than kind of a, 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 a sense of irrespective of what comes at you, having a sense of who you, who you are. And kind of, uh, I, I, found it, I found it in the Gospels also, it's very significant, as kind of this non-reactive morality or non-reactive stances, so that the behavior of other person isn't trigger for my kind of response, but rather there's a kind of fundamental commitments that orient my life that they and their barbs cannot actually touch. And, and this sense of nurturing, the sense of the solid, solid core, that seemed to me fundamental for the Jesus uh, movement. It seemed to me as fundamental to us when we were surviving under communist rule. We were, we were ourselves, no matter what they did to us. Um, and sometimes it has insidious uh, consequences also. Yeah? The, you know, more they beat us, the better we look to ourselves, no matter how terrible we are to each other. All that kind of stuff can, can happen as well. But a kind of what you have in, in Jesus, uh, really, and I, I, in Exclusion and Embrace, I call it politics of the pure heart. Uh, in, the, in a good sense of the term pure heart, a kind of sense of preservation of one's own integrity as a condition of possibility for proper engagement outside. That seems to me a tremendous gift that faith uh, can give. And um, I took it uh, as I was growing up. You know, they, they can take a lot from me, but they can't take my humanity. They can take the beauty of, of the character. I will not let them do it. They will occupy the land, they will take uh, spaces, but they cannot take that. A kind of sense which I believe can be given in Christ. Beth, did you have a question? And then Riley. In fact, why don't you both ask your questions and then um, Miroslav can respond, Beth and Riley. Okay, this is kind of connecting the dots, I think, that I wanted to share. When Karen was asking about flourishing, yesterday Paul told us about Jack McClellan that said whenever there was a disagreement, I took him to lunch. And we talked about it. And I was sitting here looking at you sitting in front of the table. And this is, we are people of the table. Christ is the host. And I think that, and then you were talking about soup, the water in the soup. <laughs> and I suddenly remembered that on the election return night, what is it, November 8th? 8th. Yeah. On that night, uh, Bob and I are meeting with our Christian, Muslim, and Jewish friends. We are gathering to watch the election returns together at table. We're mm. all bringing food because that's how we have gathered for a couple of years now. And I can think of no one, and we're all excited about it. Now, I know we're all discouraged about it, but we're excited to be together. I want to hear what they're seeing and thinking. So I just think those are connecting the dots of what it is to flourish, is to remember that we, uh, Christ is our host at the table. Thank you. Riley, why don't you speak, and then we'll hear from Miroslav, and then we'll probably have to close. My question is, from your Christian perspective as a Christian theologian, what role do you see power playing in the equation, particularly political power? And I think we can go back through the history Christian history and see that there were Christian leaders who emphasized the purity of the message and others who worked in terms of developing a power position in terms of influencing and changing the situation they were facing. I think that also one could make the case then in the Gospels, Jesus, in terms of his ministry, 
also had an element of power in his ministry and even specifically political power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, play purity of heart against notions of power. I, I think every, every stance we take is a power stance. Right? It, the power is at play everywhere, I think. Um, it's in social situations uh, around the table. <laughs> everywhere is power. A kind of sense that you can escape power is, is illusory. So then uh, one can analyze different types of power uh, and different forms in which one inserts oneself into the power uh, nexus. And I think Jesus is very much have been both kind of emphasis of inner integrity as well as in insertion of himself within the power equation of the time. I think that's what uh, we ought to do. Obviously, sometimes uh, there are uh, considerations of effects, of uh, uh, ways in which who one is uh, and the message that one has will be brought, brought to bear. Um, I think that's, and there will be lines which one will not cross, uh, I take it. For instance, uh, w w one of the lines, I keep, keep repeating this, is unless uh, any enlisted soldier uh, in an army has a right of refusal of concrete uh, tasks and, uh, and requests that are be being made of, of him or her, uh, he probably or she ought not to enlist into the army because a kind of generalized consent to uh, go to war when asked uh, would be, uh, from a Christian standpoint, inappropriate. Now, I can imagine how war might be sometimes justifiable, but I would have to draw the line and I would have to so there are some that are not, therefore I don't participate, right? So, and I think you can have an analogous um, application of that principle uh, that still means moral core is nurtured, but uh, I can be engaged or sometimes I will in ad hoc way say, sorry, this is, this, this is morally, to me, unacceptable. I need to honor my core. You actually did that. You were conscripted into the army of Yugoslavia, and you had many dialogues with your officer about your pacifistic attitude, right? I, I he did. doesn't speak theoretically about this. I will not bear arms, <laughs> even in <laughs> army, I said. May I have the uh, privilege of a follow-up question? Go ahead. And that is, I think a case could be made specifically in terms of this election that there is a contrast between a direction of purity and a direction of political power. And I would argue that Cornell West and Eddie Gloud, in terms of theologians, represent the purity side. The purity side would be I'm going to vote for the candidate that most reflects my Christian views from the standpoint of purity. Or those who say, that is not the issue today. The issue may be who is going to be the next president of the United States. And purity may, in fact, lead to a different outcome in terms of the actual election. Yeah, Briefly, because we don't want to get you into too much hot water here. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that, I, that, that, the, that, that, uh, that it can be answered um, very briefly. It's obviously a uh, complicated issue, and different folks would uh, end up on different spectrum uh, of, uh, of things. But I, on the other hand, I don't quite see the contrast. I would, I would think, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you how I, uh, how I vote. vote. I'll, I'll take a spectrum of, of, of positions that I think are at stake 
in a in a uh, election of this uh, of this sort. I'll make judgments on Christian grounds uh, on uh, how each uh, or the other will uh, will um, perform uh, in the regard to those, and and I'll cast my ballot. That's probably uh, Cornell West uh, cloud. Uh, kind of thing. The only thing that I'm afraid it doesn't quite get us off the hook, right? I was just recently, somebody sent me um, a, a, a website of, from the kind of ultra-charismatic Christianity and prophecies that are going on. Actually, it, it's the same, the same principle <laughs> that they're employing, but I'll vote my Christian conscience no matter <laughs> What happened? And yet, my Christian conscience and their Christian conscience are going in very different uh, directions, with some overlaps, but not very much. Well, that's really an awkward place to end, but... Um... <laughs> not very much. The last famous <laughs> words. <laughs> so those of you who didn't uh, hear Miroslav in the last hour on flourishing, you can uh, have your sights raised. Uh, Thank you, Miroslav, for the provocative um, questions and answers, and thank you for your work over the years. I will also put in a plug for the things you have written, or people just Google him, and you can get even some of his words um, online without buying the books. But uh, anyhow, thank you for being here. I'm thank on you Twitter and, uh, and Facebook, uh, and I fairly regularly tweet, actually. So. <laughs> so, And thank you for being a public theologian and reminding us that uh, the public life is big and enco encompasses everything and encompasses all of us, but does not totally encompass all that there is. So thank you. Do you want to just say a word about that in closing? Public? Yeah. Our responsibility as public people. Yeah, I think we have to love our neighbors. And neighbors seem to be close and they seem to be far. And therefore, love of neighbors is pursuit of the common good. Therefore, it is a commitment to care for more than just myself. Or my kind. Or my kind, uh, to care for the planet, to care for global communities, to care for our country, to care for our communities. Amen. Thank you very much, Miroslav.